This morning I'd like to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ, about the power of blood. You and I normally associate blood with war. I mean, we have seen too many movies and too many advertisements of slashers and all this stuff. And generally, when we see blood, it's because something has happened, it's been an accident. But in reality, blood is life. To God, blood isn't gore. It's sin that be it For God, blood is life. And he tells us that in Leviticus 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Admittedly, when we look at the Old Testament, there's blood everywhere. When I consider the amount of sacrifice that happened in the temple, the smell must have been overwhelming. If you've ever been to a slaughterhouse, the smell is overwhelming. Can you imagine what it must have been like to sacrifice a certain sheep, etc., etc.? A lot of blood, a lot of smell, a lot of gore, if you will. But I think this shows us the seriousness of sin. That's part of what the Old Testament is for, is showing us the seriousness of sin. And as God says in Leviticus, the passage we just heard, that we just read, life, blood, must be given to atone for sin. Blood is essential for life. It carries fuel to ourselves. It carries nutrition. It carries oxygen. And it removes those, the waste products from the cells and dumps them into the digestive system so they can be purged from our bodies. Without blood, we couldn't keep them warm or cool. We couldn't fight infections. We couldn't get rid of our own waste products. And an interesting thing, our very identity, our DNA, resides in our blood. Blood, I didn't know that. When God sees blood, he sees life. He sees life. Blood contains life. Now in his passion, Jesus shed blood several times. And I'm going to touch on just a couple of them, which I think are the most significant. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in Luke 22, 44, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus was in torment. He was in agony. And this wasn't a physical torment. Was this from the knowledge of what was going to happen to him? Of what, was, what was going to happen to him in a few hours? I think so. But I think, this is just this is uh, my opinion, I think that it was in the Garden of Eden where the sins of the world were placed upon him. Things started happening, or excuse me, the Garden of Gethsemane makes a big difference. Garden of Gethsemane. Now it's no, it's no coincidence that this was a garden. Where was the first sin committed? The garden of Eden. Now we have another garden, another garden where the first blood was shed in Eden, the covering of Adam and Eve. The last blood, our redeeming blood, was shed in Gethsemane. That's no coincidence. In the Garden of Eden is where the first sin is committed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, our ability to overcome sin was redeemed. In Eden, Adam lost his ability to say no to sin. He was given a choice. Eat or don't eat. He gave in to his own desires. And an interesting thing here is we have a tendency to look at this passage and say, well, Eve is the one that really screwed up. Well, if you look at it, Eve was deceived. Adam made a choice. Who was the culprit? Not that they both weren't in the wrong. But 
Eve was deceived and Adam made the choice to disobey God. And by this choice, Adam looked at God and said, My will, not yours. Jesus said the opposite. Father, if you are willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I believe that is where Jesus gave us the power through his blood to overcome sin. To say no to sin. Now I'm not saying that we don't sin. What I'm saying is that we don't have to sin anymore. A non-believer has no defense against sin. It's their nature. But once we are born again, we are given the ability to say no to sin. And as, I think it was Bill Johnson said last last week during our session um, that we still have the ability to sin, but it isn't fun anymore. We don't enjoy it anymore. That's a good point. That's a good point. This means that through Christ we have the power to say no to sin and every kind of bondage. Again, before we were born again, we could not say no to sin. It was our nature. But through the blood of Jesus, we can be victorious over sin. We don't have to sin anymore. The next place that Jesus shed his blood was at the whipping post. In Matthew 27, we read, Then he, Pilate, released for them Barabbas, and having scorched Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. I believe this is where his blood was shed for the redemption of our health. We're all familiar with the passage in 1 Peter 2. By his stripes, you were you. Not will be. Not even was, as he says in Isaiah, were. It's already taken care of. It's already been accomplished. Each lash that he took was for the sake of sickness. Every sickness that we could or ever would endure. Sickness, you know, is a result of the fallen nature of the world. There was no sickness in Eden until the sin entered. There will be no sickness in heaven. But when sin entered the world, sickness and death entered. In Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, passages we're very familiar with. I'm going to read to you from Young's Liberal Translation. Surely our sicknesses he has borne, and our pains he has carried them. And we, we have indeed esteemed him plagued, smitten of God, and afflicted. And he is pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his bruises there is healing to us. Does God want to do it? Yes. Jesus willingly endured this scourging for us. Think about it. Jesus was, is God. He could have stopped this at any moment. Wouldn't his act on the cross, if his death was just for our sins, wouldn't his act on the cross have been enough? Why go through this other stuff unless it had meaning? Why go through having the crown placed upon your head, the pain of scourging? Unless there was a purpose to it. He knew what he was doing. He knew that through that, he was redeeming our health from the enemy, drawing us out from under the power of sin and death, and redeeming our health. Would he have paid such a high price? If it were not his desire to heal us. And this scourging, for those of you who saw the passion of Christ, it was much worse than that. It was much worse than that. Sometimes it got so bad that internal, internal organs were exposed. It was awful. Talk about war. For our help, for you and not. Jesus went through untold suffering so that you and I could walk in. And there was the crown of thorns. One of the interesting things I find I found about the crown of thorns is that we find it also in Genesis 3, where the fall is. In Genesis 3, God said that because of Adam, the crown was cursed with thorns. The thorns are representative of curse. Jesus taking that crown of thorns. And essentially placing it on his head because he could have stopped it at any time. 
took our curse upon himself. Deuteronomy 21-23 says, For a hanged man is cursed by God. And then Paul tells us in Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone who is on the whole. The power of Christ's blood place, removes the curse from us until we sit down here. He shed his blood when his heart was pierced. He shed his blood to take away our sorrows, our pains, and our rejections. Think about what he went through. He was rejected and betrayed by Judas, by the crowd, the same crowd that five days earlier had hailed him as conquering king, now were mocking and jeering him. He was shamed, mocked, hanging naked on a cross, and even abandoned by God. And he cries out that line, Verse from Psalm 22 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' heart was broken, it was pierced, so that yours and mine can be made full again. And his heart wasn't broken so much by the spear, but I think by the anguish of having to carry the sins of the world and the diseases of the world. He endured great spiritual torment. But through his shed blood, our hearts, our emotions are redeemed. We can be made whole again. And this blood that was shed in the garden, scourging and on the cross, will never lose its power. This blood made us sons and daughters of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. We no longer live under the curse or under sickness or in the inability to say what we sin. Jesus words on the cross. It is finished. Some translations say it is accomplished. It is complete. I've done it all. There's nothing more to be done. I have reconciled everyone who will come to me to God the Father. I've done it all. I uh, took some time yesterday and I watched the movie that we're going to see here in a few weeks, The Risen. Wow. It was unbelievably powerful. Unbelievably powerful. And it shows the crucifixion in a way that I've never seen depicted before. But I think it was probably fairly accurate. Jesus talks about Gehenna and how Gehenna was the place where um, it was a garbage dump. And they say that's the place where the bodies of crucified people were dumped. They showed it in the movie. A little disturbing. But, like the passion of Christ, and I'm a little off subject here, I know. Like the passion of Christ, I felt like I was there, and I experienced that. I experienced the sorrow, the pain, the confusion. And then, later in the movie, Peter sees Jesus walking on the shore after the resurrection. And he leaps out of the boat and he runs towards him. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus, that's me. Someday that's going to be me when he goes on. Tremendous movie. you got to come, you got to see it. Back to subject. Jesus' blood contains the very life of God. God tells us that life is in the blood. Jesus' blood is the life of God. And you can see now why it is so powerful. Because it contains God's DNA. Think about how God uses the blood in the Bible. He covers Adam and Eve after their sin with coverings of protection and light. And there's the blood on the doorposts of the Hebrew people of Passover, protection from the destroyer. And then there's the sacrificial system. So much blood to 
cover so much sin. And you and I are not protected by the blood of an animal. Not redeemed by the blood of an animal. Our sins are not forgiven by the blood of an animal. But by the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. The perfect blood of God. Wow. His blood was shed lavishly at the living post and the cross. And you and I. And we are offered, when we receive Christ, the DNA of Jesus Christ, our freedom and our protection in our very life. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness, healing, deliverance, or salvation. It's Jesus' blood that makes the atonement for us. It's His blood that makes us righteous before. Satan hates the blood of Jesus because it is the very life of God and it's the thing that you feed in him. It's the thing that you feed him. In Revelation 12, 11, we read, They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. That's you and I. And Jesus gives us this blood will prayerfully apply in our lives. You've heard of some uh, apostles, I think, pleading the blood of Jesus. We can do that. It's completely legal. I pray for the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ over my life, my family, the congregation, and friends every single day. Because the blood of Jesus has great power. When we cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus, we're covering ourselves with the very life of God. So in closing, I want to encourage you. Prayerfully pray the blood of Jesus. Place a bloodline of the blood of Jesus around your home, around your family, your children, your spouse, holy trinity. Remember, Satan hates that. He won't cross it. Place the bloodline of Christ around you and protect you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, that you willingly shed your blood on the cross for us to redeem us from sin, from sickness, from shame, from sorrow, from all the, the, the evil of the and so we're asking you, Lord, to give us grace to apply your blood, Jesus, in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones. In the name of Jesus, we do right now, Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over our lives, over our families, over our congregation, over our health, Lord. We plead the blood of Jesus over our health. There are people here who are struggling in their lives daily. So right now, we pray for the blood of Jesus to be applied to their health, to their bodies, that cleansing blood, that life, the very life of God, in Jesus' name.